Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer, from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. And now, your host and the director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. Cancer patients are vulnerable to COVID-19 not only because of their disease and treatment, but because of all the physician clinic visits that they are expected to have outside of their home. To keep our patients safe from contracting COVID-19, we rapidly adapted to the changing situation by putting specific infection prevention protocols in place, including telehealth visits. Today, about 20% of our patient visits are conducted through telehealth. Telehealth decreases the number of in-person visits for patients and eliminates time spent in the waiting room or in line without impacting overall care. The visits are convenient for patients and allow virtual interaction between the provider and the patient. We do consults, second opinions, and exams through telehealth because we know that waiting at home is better than waiting in a clinic. We try to balance the need for patients to come into the clinic against what is best for them because it's our responsibility to keep our patients healthy. With me to talk about how telehealth is impacting cancer care are medical oncologist Dr. Reed Al-Rajabi and Dr. Gary Doodlittle with the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Bench to Bedside. Uh, Dr. Doodlittle, uh, you have literally decades of experience um, with telemedicine and are truly a, a tele-oncology pioneer. Could you uh, tell us about the evolution of telehealth and why it's so important that we provide these virtual visits to our patients? And great. Obviously, I'm a telemedicine, tele-oncology enthusiast, and it, it all really started um, about patients that live in the rural areas of Kansas and providing the you know, right opinion to the right patient at the right time. Um, Kansas kind of led the country, really, in our telecom infrastructure in the 90s, and it made interactive video visits or tele-oncology affordable. Since then, what's really changed is the technology. I don't know that the physician-patient interaction has changed so much, but the technology options are da you know, downright amazing right now. Uh, the whole term telehealth or telemedicine is a household word now. And before, before COVID and the push for telemedicine, it was really almost a second opinion kind of boutique type service for those cancer patients that live in the rural area. Obviously, COVID has changed the landscape for telemedicine remarkably. So, Dr. Arujabi, uh, we're, we're going to cut to the chase here, okay? Um, can you provide the same level of quality care through telehealth as you do with an inpatient visit? Most definitely. I think uh, we could do, with, with the technology that we have available right now, I think we could take care of patients very efficiently and safely across you know, the state and even the country. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, we've had multiple uh, visits now and the technology has advanced to the extent where you can share CT scans on the screen with the patient, point out uh, treatment effects, uh, talk about labs, their family members are there and you can educate the whole family about what's going on. And that's a really important thing. I think it's made it more effective in taking care of these patients more safer because communication is now disseminated, you, um, you know, across the whole support system to actually keep the patient on track and, and get what he needs at the, at the cancer center and uh, in the community. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because so much of what goes into the care of a cancer patient or any patient for that matter comes from the history. And the technology allows us to communicate back and forth very clearly with patients. The history is no different. Uh, and so much of what we do in the cancer world is based on lab findings and imaging. And all of that can still be get done so these patients can be safely treated and, you know, we want to practice A medicine, not B medicine, right? So telehealth isn't there to replace good medicine. Telehealth is there for good medicine. Mm -hmm. So um, perhaps telehealth uh, in the really the growth of telehealth is kind of a silver lining uh, to what we're going through uh, with COVID. 
Uh, do you think it's actually here to stay? Uh, I'd be interested to see what you say about this, but yeah, I think it's here to stay. Once patients get used to the convenience associated with the technology, um, it's kind of like, and I've heard this on in national meetings, it's like the genie's out of the bottle. Now when a patient realizes how convenient it can be, and for us, a lot of our patients drive in from one, two, three hours away, and to save that kind of drive and still get your cancer care, that's huge. So I think, you know, as this has all evolved, it's, it's here to stay. Now, whether it'll be exactly the same, uh, it'll depend on what happens with our reimbursement structure and some with our licensing, some of the different rules that have been lifted through COVID. If those stay relaxed, uh, telemedicine's not going anywhere. I totally agree. I think, it, you know, it's, it's provided care to the patients very far away and the, and, and opened up opportunities like clinical trials and very advanced care to them. I think um, it's, it's just beneficial every way you think about it. Mm -hmm. So if you're just joining us, we're here with medical oncologist Dr. Reed Arajabi and Dr. Gary Doolittle to talk about how telehealth is impacting the delivery of cancer care. If you have any questions, post them in the comments below. Remember to share this link with people who may benefit from our discussion. Use the hashtag bench to bedside. So Dr. Arajabi, what do your patients uh, tell you about uh, telehealth visits? Are they uh, satisfied uh, with the interaction and the level of care that, that they're perceiving? Uh, I think the majority are extremely satisfied with, with uh, telehealth and uh, the, the benefit that they're getting from it. They, they really get their needs addressed in a very timely manner without waiting in waiting rooms and in a safe fashion uh, at the comfort, in the comfort of their own homes. Uh, with their family members from, you know, Texas and New York joining in, it, it really has definitely made a big difference in many patients' lives. Now, there are occasionally patients that want that personal touch, uh, or um, the technology may be a little bit difficult for them to comprehend, or, or I wouldn't say comprehend, but deal with. Sometimes there's a lot of bugs with, with some of the, these technologies, with, which are improving over time, but sometimes patients can find that somewhat frustrating or difficult. But the majority in our practice, once they do it once, they're, they're pros at it. They're logging in, mm -hmm. waiting for their doctor to, to get into the room, just like a regular visit. So, uh, Dr. Doolittle, you uh, truly are a uh, telehealth pioneer here at, at, at KU and, and, and really nationally. Um, in fact, my understanding is you've been doing this for over two decades now. Yes, I right after I got out of medical school. Yeah. Right? That's when I started. <laughs> Shortly yeah. after junior Short, high. Right after. Shortly yeah. right. Yes. So um, what, what is your impression in terms of uh, how uh, patients are adapting uh, to uh, right. telehealth visits? So much of the population we cared for at the beginning of the tele-oncology practice, were, they were rural-based Kansans. Um, and I shouldn't make a generalization, but I'm going to. Kansans adapt and make things happen. And, you know, they, you know, everyone would say an octogenarian is not going to want to do telemedicine. And in fact, they came in and embraced the technology just like anyone else. There is no telemedicine type, right? I mean, it's, it's about approaching each individual patient and what works best for them. And, and as far as the satisfaction piece, you know, it's always compared to what? Um, would I like to see you in person? And would I like the doctor to come to the house so it's all completely convenient? Yes. If I can't have that, and I, if I have to drive to Kansas City four hours, much rather do a telemedicine visit. So it's, it's kind of a compared to what. It's not, um, it's not either or. Um, but I, I'm amazed at how well people adapt to it. And the technology has been a little bit tough. But once you get through a, a, a visit or two with a patient, you know, things are humming. And it, it's not so different than your interaction with a patient in the clinic. So um, you, you mentioned, um, you know, Kansans are able to uh, adapt. What about the uh, licensing issue? And say, for instance, if, if you, I don't know if you have a license in Missouri or not, but say you didn't have a license in Missouri, can you do telehealth in Missouri? Okay, so the laws have been relaxed, 
relaxed somewhat during uh, the COVID crisis, which was really huge. Uh, I, I, well, I have to give the government credit for this because they stepped up very quickly in reimbursed for telemedicine visits. They stepped up quickly and lessened the, the licensure requirements because prior to COVID, the telemedicine visit occurs where the patient is located. So if I had a patient in Missouri and I'm not licensed in Missouri, I couldn't see that patient by telemedicine. Now that has been relaxed and we'll see what happens. I mean, ultimately I'd like to see physicians go into a system where we had a national licensure I mean, we have a model like that through the VA, and that would alleviate that issue altogether. And then the other piece is reimbursement. And the fact that Medicare stepped up quickly and said, we don't want Medicare recipients coming into the clinic, and we don't want them to be at risk for COVID because of that. So we're going to reimburse telemedicine. So there'll be an incentive for providers to use it, but also there's a there's a very big mechanism that's set in place to be protective for patients. So it, it, it was a win-win-win for everyone, really. So Dr. al um, t tell me a little bit about kind of the special circumstances of, of a cancer patient. Are, is, does that make telemedicine more challenging uh, than, say, other uh, disciplines, or how, how does that impact? I, I really don't feel that it makes it more challenging personally, you know, taking care of our patients for the last few months. I think, uh, just like Gary said, the, the art of exam has really taken a backseat to all the technology that we re rely on to, to monitor our patients closely while they're getting their therapies. Um, I, I think um, it, it's opened up a lot more doors for our patients. Uh, um, right now, a lot of our, just like our state licensure, a lot of our clinical trials have amended their protocols to allow for telemedicine to basically, for us to be able to present clinical trials of very promising drugs uh, to our patients wherever they may be. Um, so I, I think it's, it's definitely opened up more options for, for our patients. Mm -hmm. um, it's also the, the convenience and the, and, the, and the need has sparked a lot of different uh, programs to to kind of bud out of telemedicine, like multidisciplinary clinics where a patient would have to see three different doctors on three different days, where we all come in as a group, uh, the surgeon, the radiation oncologist, the medical oncologist, and we talk about very complicated cases as a group and we know a multidisciplinary approach has always shown a, a better outcome for patients. And we're also developing inpatient uh, uh, visits, not only in the patients at, at home, let's say your doctor's in the clinic and you're, you're admitted in the hospital, that's another way of communicating where we're, we're physically you know, apart, but we could actually guide their care instead of relying on other folks that may not know them very well yep. to, to, to help them through their tough times. Yep. So, Dr. Doolittle, um, you know, one of the kind of recurring themes that um, I get feedback on out in the community is um, how important that personal relationship is between the patient and their physician. Could you... Um, Tell me a little bit about how um, telehealth is impacting that specifically, and, and what are you doing to um, ensure that as much as possible you, you preserve that, that special nature of that relationship? Right. I think in all areas of medicine, but certainly in oncology, that provider-patient relationship is, is so important, and it's one of the things that drew us to the field of oncology to begin with. And if the technology lessened the kind of relationships I have with patients, then I wouldn't want to use it. But the same skills that we use or the same approach that we use in the clinic, we just, we just transfer that to the telemedicine forum. And you know, in some ways, it makes it all even just that much more human. I mean, when we have a telemedicine visit with a patient in the home, it's like doing a home visit. And you get a, a, an idea of what their family structure is like, and there's an intimacy with that that doesn't come with a patient coming into clinic. I haven't had too many clinics from home. I think you have more from home than I do. But the one clinic I, I did have 
two clinics. One of my dogs jumped up in my lap in the middle of this visit. And, you know, first I'm kind of mortified, but the patient and the family thought it was quite funny. And you don't have to know me too long to know that I'm a big dog person. And so that just all kind of fit. It, it humanizes me. It makes me just that much more approachable. And I guess the bottom line is whatever approach you take in the clinic, good or bad, that's probably what you're going to take to the telemedicine suite. Right? That's probably the approach you're going to take there, too. So, so following up on that, uh, Dr. Al-Rajabi, do you think that um, there are situations or circumstances where telehealth can actually improve um, uh, the care that we give to our uh, patients? And kind of a related question is, um, are all cancer patients able to receive uh, telehealth visits? I think, you know, it does one major thing and is improve access. And that's, that's the key with, with the, the tertiary center for cancer care. We have access to a lot of um, treatments, technologies, research that are not available everywhere in the community. And I think that's a critical um a very critical piece of, of cancer care where, you know, if you go to a high volume center, outcomes are always in the literature better, uh, or at least get getting the, the, the direction of a high volume center in a specific subspecialty is also has, has better outcomes. So I think just the access alone really makes improves the outcomes in, in, in cancer care. Um, patients that may not be um, eligible for, um, I really can't think of any ver that, that really wouldn't qualify. I've had discussions from, you know, plans of care to, unfortunately, end-of-life discussions on telehealth, and I didn't feel that awkwardness that I didn't provide the support I needed to provide my patient. And I was, I was really, really fearful of, of having that. But sometimes patients are just really, really sick and can't come in. And they really need, you know, my help in guiding them, especially when they're their weakest. And I, I was worried about that the most, but it really didn't feel that bad. Uh, and I think the, the patients were very, very thankful and, and appreciative of, of the ability to to reach out when, when the patient was too too sick to even come in. Hmm. So Dr. Doolittle, uh, you, you've touched on this um, uh, kind of in giving us the historical perspective, but how, how uh, specifically do you think that um, this revolution in, in, in telemedicine is benefiting our rural patients, uh, both in Kansas and in Missouri? Right. I think it would come back to some of what Dr. Arujabi was talking about. I think it, it enables second opinions to occur easily. And, you know, if you live in Hayes, Kansas, and there's really good medicine in Hayes, Kansas, but if you live there and you want a second opinion, boy, it's nice to connect on the telemedicine system and, and get that opinion without having to drive four hours. I think the clinical trials piece is huge. And again, you alluded to, or spoke to that. You know, this is standard of care for a cancer patient. Clinical trials, isn't, this isn't just an edgy thing we do because we're interested. It is part of the standard for a cancer patient. And it's really hard to have that kind of portfolio in the rural setting. So both through the, a network that we have, the Masonic Cancer Alliance, and also through connections that we can make using telemedicine, we're in, able to either provide clinical trials within the community or at least connect with the patient by telemedicine if they're interested. We at least know when they do make their drive in that we have a good candidate for the trial and it's not wasted time. It's a really efficient visit. So I think that piece is, is uh, really important. And one of the things I'm really hoping for as we move forward beyond COVID is the ability to consent patients on the system to keep them from driving in only to find out that they are a candidate for the trial or they're not. And that piece we weren't really able to do prior to COVID. So I'm hopeful. We'll see what happens with that. And, and one other thing is this will also expand our care outside of normal hours. 
you know, right now you, you, you need your clinic, the physical space, but within the virtual world, you don't need any of that stuff. You're, you're free. And, you know, a lot of things we have tried to do in the past is to keep our patients out of the hospital, being able to connect with them when you're not in clinic, regularly seeing patient and, and not needing a physical space will give them more access, hopefully preventing them from getting into situations like the emergency room or the hospital. You know, I, w I would love to do a study on, on how many uh, uh, hours driving time we have saved our patients oh, yeah. through telehealth uh, visits. And I bet we could, we could probably do that because uh, we have their zip codes. Yeah, you know? I'm sure it's significant. And, and also the driving time of the family member that's bringing them, yes. the, the yep. child that's taken a day off work, work to come hours. in, yep. yeah, child care. I mean, there are all these different things that go into leaving your home where all your support system is and driving yeah. elsewhere when you have cancer to get care. So it's, it's a huge advance. And I, I, you know, I hate to say it, but this is a silver lining with COVID. If there is a silver lining, this is definitely one of them because everyone knows the term telemedicine now. Yeah. And I'm not sure that was the case in, in January this year, so. So um, at, at this point in the show, I usually ask if, if there's any kind of take home messages you'd like to convey uh, to our audience around telehealth. Uh, for me, particularly as a cancer doctor, it's all about doing whatever we can to meet the needs of the patient. And sometimes that's going to be an in-person visit, but an awful lot of the time we can substitute that with telemedicine. I just know from my own experience as a cancer survivor and in caring for my patients or, and my parents that had cancer, just getting here from a 20 minute drive away was a huge endeavor. So telemedicine can really, really help and reduce the burden of travel when you're really sick. Well, yeah, I, I think telemedicine is the next step in, in patient care. And, you know, with just the technology developments that we've had over the years, this is really the evolutionary step of how we take care of patients in the future. And I think, I, I hope it will stay supported because it's a, it's a vital tool that we can use to really take care of our patients. All right. Well, thank, uh, thanks to both of you, uh, Dr. Awajabi and Dr. Dulo. Uh, that's it for today. To learn more, please visit KUCancerCenter.org Join us next time for Bench to Bedside. Thanks for watching.